correct something that I said on uh, the class about hash tables. Remember I showed hash functions and we talked about uh, there was that sawtooth pattern that you saw in city hash and farm hash uh, from Google. And we said that the reason why it was, it was seeing that behavior is because of SIMD instructions. Well, it turns out I was incorrect. Uh, and the way I found out was I was incorrect was the unlikely, most unlikely possible place uh, could ever be corrected and have actually someone say something insightful. And that's on YouTube. Uh, so I don't know if, uh, if you guys ever seen the YouTube comments, they're notoriously uh, trashy or just, just, just very puerile. So there's, we normally get comments like these. So these are people commenting on our lecture videos that we post to YouTube, right? Andy's awful, I get headaches, uh, <laughs> right? Just, just, just nonstop, you know, uh, diatribe against, against me and my lectures. But somebody actually posted a good one. So this is somebody here, and he said, he points out the reason why we're seeing that sawtooth pattern in the, the city hash function uh, is because they're, they're maintaining this buffer that's normally 64 64 bits, and so when you're, you try to use as much of that buffer, you get the best performance. So they're not using SIMD at all because they want to use these hash functions in a variety of devices that may not be running with a full-fledged Intel Xeon you know, heavyweight processor. Right? If you're running on something like on, on a cell phone, like an ARM processor, the newer ones have SIMDs, uh, the older ones uh, do not. Right? So this, again, there's pointing out that, again, the you know, for my purposes, we don't care so much in this course how the hash functions are actually implemented. Um, it's just we want to make sure that we're correct to say that it's not actually using SIMD. Right? And again, we're not really going to discuss SIMD in this class. This will be covered in, in the advanced class in the, uh, in the spring. And then also, if you're taking 418 or 618, I think they cover that pretty heavily uh, as well. Okay. So the, the overview of where we're at in the course now is, again, we're going from the bottom to the top. And now we're in this middle part here where we're going to uh, talk about how the database system is going to execute queries. Uh, and those queries are going to access our data, or our tables, and our indexes. So we're sort of in between operating execution and access methods. So last, last week we talked about hash tables and we talked about indexes. We said this is a way, and you know, database storage and heaps and things like that. We talked about how the database system could organize tuples and organize indexes and allow something in the system to be able to access them efficiently. So now here in this class, now we're going to talk about that something. So there's a whole bunch of other operators we'll talk about in, the, in the, the future lectures about how to perform joins, how to perform aggregations and things like that. Uh, but here in today's class, we're really going to talk about how the operators in our query plan will access our underlying data structures or access methods to retrieve data and then prepare them to be passed along to, to other operators in our query plan, okay? So today's class is sort of the both of these, and then starting on Wednesday, we'll start covering this, sort of, sort of the, the, the operator execution after you've accessed it from uh, the, the, the table. So the, the first thing we have to understand, though, is what a query plan looks like in, in a relational database management system. So when I talked about relational algebra before, I talked about how it takes a SQL, qu SQL query, runs it through a parser, generates an abstract sy syntax tree, and then converts that syntax tree into relational operators, right? And it's sort of, you end up with a tree data structure like this, right? We take our select query, and then we have a, uh, we have a bunch of, of access methods that do, that do filters or do a join, then do, do projections, right? So the way I sort of think about this is that Logically, the data is flowing from the, the leaf nodes, the bottom nodes in our query plan, up into the operators, and then the final result of the query is whatever the root of the tree spits out. And typically, these, uh, these operators are, are binary, meaning you, have, uh, you can have left and right children, or you can, only have, you can have one children. Uh, some systems can handle having more than two children, um, but for our purposes, we'll, we'll just stick with two. Right? And so the, our discussion is really now talking about, in this class, is sort of how we're actually going to, the data system is going to take this query plan and execute it. And what we'll see when I start sh talking about the processing models is it seems like what you want, the way you want to implement this is 
start at the bottom and then move, push things up, but we'll see that there's different trade-offs and there's different um, implications of whether you go from the top down or the bottom up. Right? At this point here, it's just sort of a logical query plan. We didn't specify anything about how we're actually going to perform these, these op operators or execute them. Right? I'm not saying here what, what hash or what join algorithm I'm going to use. It's just we're dealing with it sort of at that level. All right, so today's class, we need to discuss three things. So the first thing we're going to discuss is how the database system is going to process that, that query plan. Then we're going to talk about how it actually then accesses the data that it's going to need in the query plan using its access methods, right? Getting it from a table, getting it from an index. And then we'll finish up talking about how the database system will take predicates that are in our SQL query and then evaluate them on, on tuples. Right, sort of the, how you take the where clause and, and look at the tuple you're looking at as you're reading the data and then apply the, the predicate to see whether it's true or false and you should include it in the output. And then in the remaining time, I'll quickly go over what's expected for you in, in project two. Okay? All right. So the first thing to talk about is the database system's processing model. So the processing model essentially specifies how the database system takes, takes that qu relational query plan and, and we'll execute it. And the, as we see as we go along, there'll be different trade-offs for different classes of applications or workloads uh, where one processing model may end up being better than another. And there's this whole other discussion that we're not going to have in this class, but we'll have later about parallelization or distributed queries or, or distributed databases. Right? For our purposes, we're going to assume that the query plan is going to run in a single thread and uh, we're just going to just focus on that. But these different processing models will have uh, different, there's different ways you actually want to implement them if you're doing multiple threads running the same query, and some are actually better than, than others, right? So we'll, as we go along, we'll discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each of these. So at a high level, there's essentially three approaches, the iterator model, the materialization model, and the vectorized or batch model. There is sort of a fourth model that's a hybrid of all these uh, that's called the push-based model, but that mostly appears uh, in in-memory databases where, you, where you're doing query compilation, which is something, again, we'll, we'll, we'll push off until the, the advanced class. So let's go through each of these one by one. So the most common processing model that's used in pretty much almost every single database system uh, is called the iterator model. So the confusing thing about databases is that there's the same, there's different names can be given to the same concept. So sometimes you'll see this called the volcano model because there was a famous paper in the early 1990s for a system called Volcano, and they sort of laid out what we're describing here, although it existed before then. Um, there's also some, sometimes peers in other textbooks or in the literature as the pipeline model. They're all, they're all essentially the same thing. And so the way to think about the, the iterator model is that every query plan or every operator that's in the system that, you, that you, your query plan could invoke has to implement this standard API that has this next function or this next method. And what happens is every single time you call next on that operator, uh, the operator either, either needs to return the next tuple that is that it, that it needs to produce or emit, or returns a null marker that says, I, I don't have any more tuples for you. And then therefore you should not invoke that operator anymore. And so in, internally what's going to happen is that when you call next, there'll just be sort of this, this for loop on the inside of the operator implement, implementation that scans over whatever data it's trying, it's trying to access, and for every tuple that it finds, it returns that for the invocation of next. So that means you have to maintain some metadata, like a cursor, on the inside of the, of, the, of the operator so that when you call next again, you pick up where you left off. And that way you don't return back duplicate tuples. So what will happen is for some operators that have children, you'll, when you call next on the parent operator, they then call next on their children operators. And then those children then have to do whatever they need to do to pr produce a tuple. Right, so this is really easy for humans to understand, uh, and it, it, this actually makes it also very easy to parallelize, um, which again, we'll, we'll talk about later. But let's, let's go through an example so you can understand this better. So let's say I have a simple join query here, and then this is that same uh, relational query plan that I saw before. 
So normally, I don't like to show code in, uh, in my lectures or any presentation that I give, but I think it's kind of unavoidable here, and hopefully this will make it more obvious to understand. So for each of these relational operators, there'll be an implementation of their, of their next method, right? And what will happen is when you see it for these, they have this emit function that basically is like a yield in Python where you're saying, here's the thing, here's for this current iteration, here's the, here's the, the element that you want, or here's the next tuple. And so the way this will get executed is that the database system will start at the root and invoke this next method. And internally for this, for this projection, it has a for loop that's going to call next on its child. It only has one child. And for every tuple that the child produces, it can then spit that out to be the output of the query. So this thing iterates through and calls next, which then calls this function inside of our join. Now this one's a bit more different because in order to do the join, you actually have to get all the data from your, your children, right? So it first has the for loop where it calls uh, next on all the, the, the left node children. And so this case here, this is the, the, the access method of the scan operator. It's just gonna keep looping over this and keep emitting every tuple that it has in the table A. And then the, the join operator then takes that and builds the hash table, which is used for hash joins, which we'll, we'll talk about next week. Um, and then when it has everything on the left side, then it goes to the right side and does the same thing. It calls next on the, on the filter operator, which then calls next on the scan operator, right? And then you're just sort of taking a tuple one at a time and, and pushing them up or moving them up to the query plan, right? So this is pretty straightforward to understand, right? This is, you just, it's, it's sort of an, a nice programming uh, paradigm, or API, right? It makes it really easy to then plop in different operators, as long as they implement the next API, you don't care about how they're actually generating the answer. You sort of chain together these different operators in different ways to compute any possible SQL query uh, that, that you, could, you could want, All right? So as I said, this is the most widely used uh, uh, processing model in every database system. Every, pretty much every database system you can think of uh, is, is likely using it. These are the ones I, I can actually confirm from their, from their documentation. Another aspect of this that is, is, can make this really, actually really efficient is that it supports what's called pipelining, meaning I can take the output of like a child operator that calls next, and then I can do some processing on it and pass it up to the next guy, and they can pass it on to the next guy. So you could have this sort of pipeline of operators that are taking the same tuple and doing as much work as you can, on pos as, as you can, on pos as you can possibly do with it before you maybe go back and call, call and get the next tuple. Right? And this is efficient if you think about it from a, a disk-based database system. Right? I can take, take, take you know, one tuple, fetch the page that it's in in memory, and then do as much with it as I can before I go back and fetch, fetch the next page for the next tuple. Because right? otherwise you could have this sort of ping-ponging effect where you fetch a tuple, get the page, fetch, or fetch a page, get the next tuple, then immediately go back and get, get another page to get the next tuple. And then later on, now your buffer gets full, and the tuples that you brought in earlier are now get swapped out the disk. So when you go to the next operator, you got to fetch those pages again, right? So this is also why this is called the sometimes called the pipeline operator or pi pipeline model. So that pipelining thing that I just talked about, though, the pipelining uh, uh, optimization, you can't actually do it for all the operators in your query plan. So I showed in, in the previous example for the join, I got to get all the tuples I need from the left and all the tuples from the right, and then and only then can I, can I compute the join. Uh, or at least you have to do it for the left side, you don't have to do it for the right side. Uh, you have to, do this, you have to do this sort of blocking for the same way when you do subqueries, uh, or if you have an order by, or you don't know how to sort things unless you have all the elements you want to sort. And so there are some operators that, that, will, that are not going to be able to do that pipelining, and they're sort of pipeline breakers. But in one nice aspect of the, of the iterator model is that it's really easy to then, again, sort of compose complex queries by uh, just chaining together these different operators. But then there's also sort of this natural flow control for certain operators that you want, you want to limit the number of output, right? So in the case you have the limit clause, if you attach that to a scan operator, the limit will keep track of how many tuples do I have so far. If I only need 100 and I have 100 tuples now, I'll stop calling next because I have everything that I'll need, 
Right, so you have this sort of built-in mechanism to do flow control um, or output control just based on the how many times you call next. Okay? So I would describe the iterator model as sort of the jack of all trades, this general purpose scheme that is good enough for, for, for OLTP queries and good enough for OLAP queries and good enough for parallel queries and, 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 and sort of embedded database systems, right? It's just, it's just, this is what pretty much everyone does and it's good enough for most things. So now when I talk about the, the materialization model and the, and the vectorized model, these are sort of optimizations or these are, these are schemes that are actually better for one particular class of workload, whereas this one's more general purpose. So in the materialization model, the, instead of going from the top down as you did in the iterator model, you're gonna go from the bottom up. And what'll happen is every time you invoke an operator, it does whatever computation that it needs to do on all of its input. It, it assumes that it has all the input it's gonna need all at once. And then it does that processing and then it ships it up, the, the complete output that it's gonna generate, it ships it up to its parent and then you never invoke that operator ever again, right? So the, again, it's called materialized because you're, again, you're materializing all the output for that particular operator. So this is tricky for some things because now we don't have that natural control where uh, you know, if there's a limit clause, it can stop calling next to make sure that it doesn't produce anything it needs. For, for this, because you're gonna process all your data all at once inside the operator, the operator may not know anything about limits, right, because the limit clause would be further up in the query plan. So to make this work for these kind of scenarios so that you're not scanning more data, more data than you actually need, you actually do a push down on providing hints inside of the scan operators and the lower level things at the bottom of the query plan so that they know when to stop or they know how to filter things out early on. So let's go back to that example we have now. And so now what you see is that in the every single operator, I now have this output buffer that I'm gonna generate for, for, my, uh, uh, for my operator. And then when the operator finishes, just assume that it's gonna get shipped up. So for here, at the bottom of my query plan, I have the, uh, the scan on A and B. So I'll invoke this guy first, uh, and then it's gonna ship up its, its output buffer to that, that parent, and then I'm gonna invoke this, this operator, and does the same thing, ships it up to the next guy, who then does the filtering, uh, and then ships it up there. So now at this point, for the join, I have everything that I need. I have the right side, I have the left side, does the join, fills out its output buffer, and then shoves, shoves it up to, to the parent. Right, again, the, the, there's implicit in this, in this sort of code here is like a return uh, call to send the output up, up the tree. So, let me take a guess why this is, this is what, what, what particular workload would this be good at? What particular workload would this be bad at? T take a guess, yes. Right, so he says, uh, you wanna be careful that your output can fit in memory because if, say this is scanning the entire table, you're basically making another copy of that and then shoving it to the next operator. So where would this be a bad, how could this be bad? Right, so th let's say that in this case here, right, say that you, you can recognize that I don't have a filter, I'm just scanning this table, so maybe I'll just pass the pointer to the table to the next guy, right? But in this case here, you have to do some filtering, so you have to materialize the, the, the tuples, because otherwise the, the top thing might be joining things that shouldn't be there, right? So when, when, what kind of query would this be bad at? What kind of database would, be bad, really, would this be bad for? OLAP, right. So if you have a really large database, I have a billion tuples, uh, and my filter maybe filters out only you know, half of them, so I have 500 million tuples that I need to materialize in an output buffer, then then shove it out to the, to the next operator. So this is typically bad for, uh, for OLAP queries uh, because, the, the, again, the intermediate results can be really large. And the, but for OLTP, this is fine because you're only grabbing you know, usually a single tuple, right? This is, you know, for this particular query, you would actually maybe want to flip the join order, but that's, we'll talk about that later. But like, so for this, you're typically maybe gonna only access like maybe a couple dozen tuples, right, in an OLTP query. 
So that output buffer is small. And so this is also a better for than, than the iterator model because I'm not calling next, next, and next over and over again, right? I'm just, just running my, 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 my operator, it generates my answer, and I shove it to the next guy. So this is actually how we implemented a uh, query, uh, query processing model in, in HDOR, which was the academic uh, predecessor of VoltDB. And the last time I checked, they're still, they still do it the way we did it uh, back in the early days. Um, the advantage you're going to get from this is that it provides for lower execution and coordination overhead because you don't need to maintain an internal uh, uh, cursor for every single operator to figure out where you left off the last time you called next, right? You just take the data, crunch on it, and then spit it up to the next guy. Um, so I say it's more difficult to parallelize, and what I mean by that is the, you have to sort of, um, maybe it's the same as iterative, but the, you basically have to, to figure out ahead of time how to partition your, your table in such a way that you can have one thread, you know, read one piece of output, one thread, read another piece of output, and then you have to combine them together at, at some, some, some point in your query plan. So I, when I say more difficult to parallelize, it doesn't mean it's impossible, it's just, it's just more, some, some, some more things we have to deal with. Um, so what's interesting is that MonadB is probably the other most famous system that's using the materialization model. Uh, MonadB is actually an OLAP system. Uh, I, I need to look at their literature again, but they use materialization model. Uh, I, forget, I forget why they explain why. And then they had a bunch of papers that came out later that basically did the sort of, did parallelization to sort of break it up so that although each operator is materializing its entire output, each operator is only maybe processing a, a portion of the data. And you have to be very aggressive in pushing down predicates and other things to, to limit the size of the output buffer. All right? So, the, the last model we'll talk about is, is the vectorization model, which sometimes calls the batch model. And it's essentially like the iterator model where you call, have this next function that you keep calling as you go down the tree. Um, but the difference here is that instead of calling for every, when you call next, instead of getting back a single tuple, you get back a batch of tuples. And this sort of seems obvious, but the, uh, no system, as far as I know, actually implemented this until the, the, the mid-2000s. Um, so again, when you have that internal loop that inside of your operator that's going to look through over all the tuples, uh, instead of after processing one tuple and then immediately returning the result to the next operator, it sort of maintains a buffer, fills that buffer up, and then when that buffer is lar you know, large enough, then it finally then emits that to, to the parent. Right? So the tricky thing about this is that the size of the batch is hard to get right, right? It depends on what the hardware looks like, depends on what your data looks like, what the query is actually trying to do. Um, and so there's been some work in this area to figure out how to, how to tune these, these batch shots properly. So now we go back to our, uh, our, our, our example. Now it basically looks like the materialization model where I'm filling up some buffer. And, but now I'm checking to see whether the buffer is larger than my batch size, and if it is, then, then I shove it up. And again, implicit here is that when you shove it up, then you go ahead and clear it out. Right? So again, now we start from the top and go down. It calls next, or gets the output buffer from, from the, the, its children, which then gets the output buffer from here, and so forth on the other side here. All right? So can we take a guess what this would be good for? What kind of workload or, or queries would this be ideal for? So he says there'd be no improvement for operators such as joins. Right, so his statement is that in the case of, of the, of, for the join operator, I have to wait for all the results anyway, so, so it's not that big of a win. Well, except that you're not going to call next as many times, right? If I have a million tuples and my, my batch size can be, you know, uh, 100,000, I would call next, you know, 10 times. So what, what, what kind of queries would this be good for? Correct. A analytical queries, right? Because these type of queries are often doing large scans on the entire table. 
And that means now down in your, uh, in the sort of the low level access methods, the operators that are actually accessing the data, you can actually now use SIMD and other optimizations to, to sort of speed those things up, right? So the big thing is that, again, you're gonna reduce the number of call, of next calls. Uh, this is not so much a big deal for a, for a disk-based database system because going out to disk is always the most expensive thing. So doing a lookup in the virtual function table or doing, uh, uh, f having to follow a function pointer to get to, you know, to, to, to execute the predicate is not that big of a deal, or actually to invoke next is not that big of a deal. But again, if you have really large databases and, and, and a lot of it can fit in memory, then those things start to add up. So again, we won't talk about this in this class, but the, if you're processing batch of tuples, you can actually do, uh, do you can vectorize a bunch of the, the comparisons and other things, the filters you want to do on that data um, because you can operate on batches. Now, most of the systems that actually do this technique to do um, SIMD on, on the scans, or SIMDs in your query plans, only really do it on the, the low level scan operators because that's, that's where you actually get most of the benefit. Right? It's hard to do SIMD uh, in, a, in a join algorithm um, and it actually doesn't help you that much because the cache line misses always, always kill you. So vector wise was the sort of first system as far as I know that, sort of, that defined or, or implemented the, the vectorized model. Uh, we actually use this in Peloton, the system we're building here, but this is also used in Facebook's Presto. And then both SQL Server, so, so Microsoft and, uh, actually we should include IBM here. So Microsoft and Oracle and IBM all have these specialized in-memory column store engines that follow the vector, vectorized model, whereas the regular system, like the, the original systems that they have, use the iterator model. And so again, the, you get better speed up for these guys because again, you're, you're processing batches of tuples and you can apply SIMD predicates on them, okay? So just to summarize everything I said, again, that we have three vectorization model, sorry, three pro query processing models, iterator, materialization, and vectorized, and the volcano and the vectorized are doing top down, materialization is bottom up, and then the volcano or the iterator model sends out a single tuple, whereas the materialization model in sends out the entire result set for that, that operator, and the vectorized one produces a tuple batch. And then the volcano or iterator model is general purpose, Materializations for OLEDP and vectorizes for uh, yes. Is the use of any of these models mutually exclusive? Wouldn't you want to have a database system that can do materialization for an OLTP and vectorize for an OLTP? So his question is, um, are these query processing models mutually exclusive, or could you have a system that actually could implement all of these? So. So there are some hybrid systems. I think uh, high-rise can do uh, materialization and vectorization. Um, the examples I gave before for, for, you know, so SQL Server has this engine called Apollo. Oracle has this thing called in-memory column store. And then IBM has, DB, it's called DB2 Blue. These are sort of these extra engines that sort of you can plug into your database system that use, that are targeting these classes of workloads. The upper level parts of the system are all still the same, but internally, these different engines implement these different models. I think it'd actually be difficult to implement a database system that a single database engine that could do all of these, right? Because basically you have to implement all your operators twice, right? So that, that there's, some, there's, you know, there's no technical reason you couldn't do that, but from a software engineering reason, that's, that'd be quite hard. And so typically what you do, again, you have these different engines that you can plug in, uh, that the upper level parts of the system can route queries to, and then they can apply, you know, they use the, the different query processing models based on, you know, what they're targeted for, right? In the case of, so in the case of Peloton, the, vector, the vectorization model is, you know, it's essentially the same thing in some ways as the iterator model, right? If you just make your, if you make your batch size one, then it's the same, right? The, Original version of Peloton does the vectorization model. The newer one does this query compilation stuff, which is you're sort of pushing things up from the bottom. That's advanced. We don't need to discuss that here. Okay? But that's a good question. Anyway, anything else? Okay. All right. So now we can talk about what these, the, these bottom operators are actually going to do. 
So the, in all my examples, I talked about how there's this for loop inside of, at the bottom of the query plan with these operators that are iterating over something, the table, and they're emitting tuples. And so now we need to talk about how we actually implement these things. So in a database system, these operators are called, usually called access paths or access methods. It's how the database system is going to access the underlying data of, of, of the table. And so there is no actually mapping or corresponding operation in relational algebra to these access methods. Right? When you define a relational algebra query, you just said, here's my relation, and then you applied a filter, or you did whatever else you want on it. So now we're actually talking about how the data system is actually going to, you know, what, how it's going to decide what, uh, what, what algorithm it's going to use, or what data, physical data structure it wants to target to get data out, and then can shove it up to the, to the other operators in our query plan. So there are three basic approaches that we're going to talk about. Essentially, there really is only two, uh, the sequential scan or the index scan. Um, I'm including the multi-index because it's slightly different than how you do a regular single index scan. Um, but there's, you know, if you look at maybe like Oracle's documentation, they have all these different access methods or access paths, heap scan, uh, table or row ID scan. At, at the end of the day, they're really going to be either one of these, right? Either scan every single page and look at every single tuple inside of it. Maybe you have a nice way to jump around to it to get only look at the pages you maybe actually need. Or you're going to scan, scan the index. Right? So at a high level, there's only really two that we care about, but I'll, sort of, I'll break it up in three. So sequential scan is, as I said, is basically where you have no index you can use to speed up your query. And so the operator basically jumps to the very first page for that table, fetches it, uh, then scans every single tuple one by one, and then when it's done, then it goes, goes to the next page. Right, and then depending on whether you're doing a, you know, the, the iterator model or the materialization model, right, you may you know, read a tuple, send it up to the, to the next operator, uh, or just keep reading all the tuples in that page. So as I said, the, the database system will maintain this internal cursor inside the operator that will keep track of the last page and slot that it examined as it does, the, as it does this processing. And so you can essentially implement a sequential scan as a nested for loop. Right, for a given table, iterate over all its pages, and for every single page, iterate all, all, over all its tuples. Then you evaluate some predicate and, and then do something with, with that tuple satisfies it. So the, this is the, you know, this is like the, how do I say this? The sequential scan is like the, the, the fallback method for the database system to, to ex execute a query. Right, if there's no index, it doesn't, can't figure out what to do, this is like the, the dumbest thing to do, but you know, it's guaranteed to always produce the correct answer. The problem is, though, this is really, really slow, right? Because if every single page of my table is out on disk, then I go fetch, fetch that page, right? And I'm sort of blocking every single time I need to, I need to fetch something. So the, there are some optimizations we can do to, to speed this up. But in general, I would say this is always, again, sequential scan is like the worst case. It's just, it's just always the worst thing, uh, or almost always the worst thing. Some joins can be pretty crappy, too, but this is, this is usually bad. So a lot of times when you see, you know, uh, if you look on Stack Overflow or see other message boards about people saying, my database is slow, how do I speed it up? Uh, often what people say is just how many sequential scans are you doing, and, get, and can you avoid them by, by adding indexes? Because right, we talked about this before when we talked about buffer pool replacement policies, when you're sequentially scanning something, you're basically trashing your, your buffer pool. Like, if the system's not careful, right, scanning stuff in and throwing out pages that may be needed very soon, and throwing them out for pages you're going to read once and, and throw away. So we talked about some optimizations before to speed this up. We talked about prefetching, right, where the, the data systems can recognize you're doing a sequential scan. So when you read the first page and you return that back to your thread to, to process it, in the background, maybe it fetches the next couple of pages ahead so that when you come back, you know, while you're doing your processing, that data can be fetched in. So when you come back, it's, it's already there for you. Um, we'll also talk about how to do parallel uh, sequential scans later on in, in a few weeks. Um, but I want to talk about three additional optimizations you can also apply to sort of speed, speed this up. And again, the, the end of the day, the sequential scan is always going to be super slow. Uh, so these are just, you know, these aren't going to make these things go. These tricks are not going to make your sequential scan be magically fast like your index scan, but it's, it's, 
they help. So we'll talk, we'll talk, just talk, talk about these last three here. So uh, the, a zone map is a, the way to think about a zone map is that it's a pre-computer ag aggregate uh, for the data within a page that'll be stored in a separate page inside the database system. So zone map is the Oracle term. Uh, I, I, other systems may call them other things uh, for trademark reasons, but in general, when people say a zone map, or people talk about the concept I'm talking about here, they would, they would typically use the term zone map. And so what will happen is, say you have, uh, you have your original data, right? So say we have a table that only has a single column, and it has five tuples with these, these five different values. Um, so what it can go do is that it'll pre-compute five different aggregate functions for all the data in, in, that, in that page. Right? So let's say, again, say this was now you know, 1,000 tuples. I'm still only going to have five different entries in my zone map because they're an aggregation of, of all, all the tuples in that page. So now when my query comes along, Right, say something like this, I want to do a select, I want to find, uh, I want to find all the values that are greater than 600. If I don't have a zone map, I essentially have to do a sequential scan and, and you bring the page in and look at every single attribute. But with a zone map, I can just go look and say, well, I know my predicate is checking for values that are greater than 600, but the max value for all the data that's in this page for this particular attribute, the max value is 400. So 400 is less than 600, so I know there's not going to be any tuple that I, I, I could, that I could ever find inside of this page that would satisfy my, my query. So far, I just skip this in page entirely. Right? And so because these zone maps are much smaller than the, actual, uh, the original data, uh, you can try to keep these in memory. Or you can, you, can, you can pack a lot of them within a single page, so when you go fetch one page for zone map data, you're bringing in a lot of different zone maps for, for, for different pages. So this is sort of like a materialized view, which we haven't talked about yet. We'll talk about next week. But again, just the database system will, will automatically keep the zone map data in sync with the original data. So if I insert a tuple into this page that now has a value of 600, it, the data system knows that, oh, I have to go to my zone map and make sure I update that to make sure it reflects the same value. Because the data system cannot have any false positive or false negatives. Right? Some systems can. That's not what we're talking about here. So just assume that the zone map is always going to be strongly consistent or always synchronized with the, the real data. So this is in uh, a bunch of systems, as I said. So, so Oracle does this. Natiza is a specialized system that was got bought by IBM. Um, DB2 does this, Impala does this inside of the Parquet files for the, in the Hadoop file system, and then Vertica does this uh, as well. Vertica's a, all these are OLAP systems. Right? This doesn't really help OLTP because OLTP uh, workloads are usually going to have indexes to go find the single thing you need. This really is only helping for sequential scans. The next optimization we can have is what's called, what I'll call buffer pool bypass. And the way to think about this is that and as, as you guys implemented for your first project, and as we talked about in the lectures, to go into the buffer pool to get a page is actually kind of an expensive operation. Right? You take a latch on the, on the, on the page table, um, then you update some pin information, maybe update or some reference counters, update the LRU chain. Right? So this is, this, you know, all this sort of adds up if you're scanning a lot of pages. So with the buffer pool bypass is that you basically fetch the page from disk, you can't avoid that, but then rather than putting it into your buffer pool with all the other pages in your database, you store it in your so it's memory that's local to your thread, uh, do whatever processing you need on it, and then when you're done with it, just throw it away. So this is obviously tricky because there's actually some extra, uh, some extra work you have to do to make sure that nobody's trying to maybe modify the same page as you, you know, the same time you're reading it. Uh, but if your workload is, is read, only or read, read only or read mostly, then this actually might work out. So this works really well for, for sequential scans where you need to read a bunch of data that you know is contiguous on disk. Right? You, have, like, you, know, you, have, you have these 4K pages, and they're all lined up on the same platter in the, in the same order. So you can just do a single sequential read on disk and go fetch them all in to, to your memory. So as far as I know, I don't know of any system 
that actually supports this feature other than Formix, and they call it light scans um, to essentially do this, this, this buffer pool bypass. Uh, Informix was a system that came out of the 1980s that got bought by IBM. And so it's one of these leg legacy enterprise systems. Um, it's very expensive. All right, so the last thing is to do what's called heap clustering. So before when I talked about table heaps, I said that the database system would st store tuples in unsorted order in the heap pages. Um, and then I alluded a little bit when we talked about indexes to say, oh, in, in systems like MySQL and SQLite, they can actually pack the tuples in the leaf node pages of your, of your B plus trees. And that keeps them in sorted order. So this technique is actually has a name. It's called, uh, called clustering indexes. So anytime you see people talk about clustering in the context of, of database storage, right? Don't think of like you know a, a, a distributed cluster. Think of like think of what, what I'm talking about here, where you're you're clustering the tuples in the pages, the heap pages, in the order specified by an index. All right. So now what happens is that when you want to go maybe do a scan uh, and you have some key maybe as a starting point. You don't have to start from the beginning and just you know, go in sequential order. You actually can maybe do binary search or jump to some offset where you know that you, you, know, you have your starting, starting value. So the way to think about this is say you want to scan across all the leaf nodes here. Uh, as you scan across and look at every single uh, uh, record ID that's pointing to some, some, some page down below, right, you're going to get them in, in the, the order that's specified by, by the index. So this can help speed up queries, again, when you're doing a, a lookup on, on the thing that is sorted by. So as I said before, some systems will do this automatically for the primary key. Um, and, if, and if you don't specify a primary key, they'll synthetically define one for you. Like in SQLite, it's your row ID uh, that they then used to, to figure out how to, how to cluster your, 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 your tuples. So uh, this will come up later on. But some systems actually don't support this. Uh, where well, they support it sort of half of the way. So with a true clustering index, any single time I, I insert or update or delete a tuple, the, the data system will do work to make sure that those things are always maintained in sorted order. Postgres actually can't do this uh, or do that automatic update. They have a cluster function, a cluster, cluster operator that you can invoke that, that will take all your, your table pages and sort them all at once based on some, some, some key or some attributes. But it doesn't actually maintain them in that sort of order. So you can sort them once, and then the operation finishes. But then if you come back and update things, or delete things, or change things, it doesn't maintain that sort order. And they do this because that's how they implement uh, their concurrency control scheme, which we'll talk about in a, in a few weeks. Right? So all the commercial systems can do clustered indexes. And I think I talked about last time how in like Oracle and DB2, you can, or, or not. Oracle and SQL Server, you can specify that sometimes you want some tables to be used as clustering indexes and other ones don't, right? This is some option you can turn on for, for in some systems. All right, so now related to this is how to do an index scan. So the basic idea of the index scan is that the, the data system is going to pick some index, one or more, and it's going to know how to do a lookup to find a starting location in that index, and then scan to, you know, in sorted order to find all the tuples that it, that it needs. So for our discussion here, we'll just assume that we're dealing with a B plus tree, but there's nothing that I'm talking about that couldn't also be applied for the radex tree or skip list. Hash indexes, you can't do this because the, the keys aren't stored in, in sorted order. So the so the first thing the data system has to do in order to do an index scan is obviously pick what index you want to scan. So to do this, you have to look at a bunch of different things that, uh, all at the same time. So you have to look at what attributes that, that the index is based on, what attributes are in the where clause of the query that, is, that it's referencing, what the values look like in the actual, uh, those attributes. Right? Is it just two, you know, two values, male, female, or is it a billion different things? Um, then you have to look at what the predicate is actually doing. Is it greater than, less than, equal to? Uh, and then lastly, you have to know whether the index is actually, you know, is it, is it using unique keys or non-unique keys? 
So all of these things are what the data system will do to figure out what's the best index to use for my query. What, what's the best set of indexes used for my query? So we're going to punt on this entirely uh, for now because this falls under the domain of what's called query optimization or query planning. This is where, again, the database system takes your SQL query and has to generate an efficient query plan. And as part of that, it has to figure out what the, you know, what indexes to use. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in, in a few weeks from now. So for now, we'll just assume that the database system knows how to pick indexes. Um, and to show you why this is, you know, wh how, how this can affect you, uh, say that we have a really simple table, a really simple database, uh, that we have a student's table. We have, a, we have 100 students, um, and we have two indexes. We have an index on age and an index on department. And so my query wants to do a lookup to find all of the students that are under the age 30, that are in the CS department, and are, are, are resident in the, in the US. So assume that we want to pick one index to, to, to do our index scan. Basically what would happen is we, we would pick that index, we would extract whatever the constant value we're doing our lookup inside of our, our, our where clause to know how to, how to traverse that index to land at some leaf node. And then based on whether we're doing less than or, or equals, we could either just go grab the single tuple or scan along the leaf nodes to get all the, the tuples we need that satisfy it. So the first choice is say if you had, uh, or first scenario would be say that of your 100 people in your, in your student table, 99 of them are under the age of 30, but then there's only two people in the CS department. So the data system will look at this and say, well, I, I need to pick, I have these two indexes, which one should I choose? And we take a guess. What's that? Right, department, because you only have two, two uh, people. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a non-unique index, so you just land exactly to get the, the, the data you need. Uh, but let's say if it was reverse of that, we had 99 people in the CS department, but then only two people under the age of 30, you actually want to end up picking the under, other index. Uh, so this is actually a bad example in some ways, because you wouldn't actually want to build a, depending on the number of different departments you have, the, the fact that there's two people in the CS department might be a bad choice of the index, right? So the, the data system is going to look at this and figure out, well, which of these two scenarios, or looks at each scenario and looks at, you know, what the data looks like, what my query looks like, and then it'll choose one of them to scan. Yes? Uh, does the index that we built when you move from scenario one to scenario two? Say it again, sorry. Uh, when you move from scenario one to two, like, the uh, composition of the members is changing, does it maybe try to change how it's indexing the data? So his question is, say I, I, the question is, say my data look, really looks like this, and then I dump everything out, and then load it back in, and it looks like, and then it starts out with this, and then it becomes this. His question is, does how the data system choose, decides how to index things change? The answer is no. Most database systems, almost all database systems are, you have to tell it how you want to index things, right? So if I just define my table and I don't specify anything being unique or specify any primary key, the data system is not going to make any indexes for me. The DBA, it's sort of what the DBA's job is. They have to come in and say, well, my data looks like this, my queries look like this, I want to have this index or that index. Um, and as the data you know, evolves over time, the assumptions you made maybe for the first scenario may no longer hold for the second scenario, but the data system is not going to know how to, to, to modify itself. Another way to think about this too is the sort of two problems. What indexes do I want to have? And then how do I actually want to store those indexes? Do I want to use a radix tree, a B plus tree, a hash table? So in some cases here, uh, having only two people in the, in, the, in the CS department might mean a hash table might be better for that. And in theory, the data system could change the index data structure on the fly based on what the, how the, the workload changes, so the database changes. As far as I know, no database system actually does that. We're, we're, yeah, so, so without trying to uh, toot my own horn, this is essentially what we're building now at CMU. Right, so we're trying to build a database system that can, can look at your database, look at your workload, and make these choices for you. Right now, humans have to do this. There's a bunch of tools that the major, the commercial database system vendors provide where you feed a bunch of query traces, you feed it your database, and then it spits out, hey, I think you should have these indexes. But those are sort of a manual process, and, and the human has to make the final value judgment to decide, do I want to add this index, index or not? Um, 
Oracle announced their autonomous database system yesterday. Uh, as far as I know, they're not picking indexes yet. Their idea of autonomous means that it patches itself for security upgrades automatically, um, which is actually a big deal. So that, that's actually pretty cool. Um, I want to knock on Larry. He might be watching these videos. Uh, OK, so uh, the world is not as black and white as I just showed here, right? The, in the previous example, it was obvious you know, what index you want to use for either of those two scenarios. But it's usually not you know, it's, you know, cleanly divided like that. So some database systems can actually support what are multiple index scans, where you can do a probe uh, on the different indexes, and you have a way to coalesce the results, and then you know, do the final filtering you need to, in the, in the, to produce the answer. So the way this basically works is that you're going to compute a set of record IDs for each index, and then you then combine those, those, those two sets together, right? If it's a... If you have a bunch of conjunctions, like an AND, then you just take the union. Um, sorry, you, if it's conjunctions, you take an intersection. If it's a disjunction, you take the union of them. And then once you have all those, those set of record IDs that satisfy whatever your predicate is across all those, uh, all, all, all those indexes, then you go actually retrieve the actual underlying tuples and then do whatever final filtering you have to do. So this is sort of a variation of uh, the index scan and, and or a combination of the index scan and the and the sequential scan um, because you may have to go back and do another sequential scan after you probe, probe all the indexes. So Postgres calls this a bitmap scan because they're going to generate bitmaps for each index and then combine them together. Um, but you could implement this in, in any, any different data structure. And again, all the commercial systems, I think, can do this. So let's look, look at our example here, right? So we have an index on age, we have an index on department. So the first thing we'll do is go to the index on age, compute that uh, set of record IDs, then go and get the, the, the record IDs for department equals computer science. Then we take the intersection of the two because it's an and clause. Uh, and any bit in the first record set that's also set in the other record set uh, will then be set, set to true. And we know those are the tuples that satisfy both predicates. We go fetch them. Then we apply our, our last predicate on, on the country. Because right, we, don't, we don't have an index on that. We still have to look at the underlying data. So visually, it looks like this. Right? So as I said, in Postgres, they implement the record sets as, as bitmaps. But you could also do hash tables. You could do a bloom filter. Right? Bloom filters will give you false positives, but, but not false negatives. So that's OK. Um, so we do our, our scan on, on the age, get, get a set of record IDs, do a scan on department, get another set of record IDs. And then it's this middle part here where, where we have the intersection. We know that we have tuples that satisfy both of them. And then we go, go do a sequential scan on the pages to go find those, those particular tuples. So, uh, right. Um, yeah, I think, I think we'll go here. OK. So the, the last thing to talk about for index scans is that um, if you're operating on, if you're doing an index scan on an unclustered index, meaning the tuples are not sorted in the order that's specified by that index, then you have this problem where if you scan along the leaf nodes and look at all your tuples one by one as you find them, then that actually might be the worst thing you possibly do when you actually need to retrieve data from disk. So again, let's say our scan direction is going in this way. Uh, and then, so as my cursor bops along the leaf nodes and look at each, each, each record, again, I do my lookup to say, well, what's, what page is this tuple in? Do, go fetch the page, then go, go find the tuple at the offset, and then I go to the, to the next tuple, which might be in a different page. So as I do my scan like this, you can see that, the, that I'm doing lookups in all those, these different pages in sort of random order. Right? So when you actually map out what pages you're accessing to do the scan, you can see here, these blocks represent every single time that I had to go fetch a page. Now, you know, if you have enough memory, then maybe this is not big of a deal because the result set for the, or the, the, the working set for this query could all fit in memory. But if you have a really large database and you're scanning a really large index, then you may actually have this problem where you're doing separate fetches for every single time you get a new page. So the way to solve this problem is just scan the index first, figure out all the record IDs you're going to need to access, 
then sort them based on the page ID, and then access them together so that you, you combine together all the lookups for the, for the page, for the beginning page. That way, now before where I had all these random page fetches, now I only have to fetch, fetch four. Right? Yes? I was wondering what is indexing, like clustering index? What is a clustering index? What, what is a clustering index? So as, as I said before, the clustering index is it's when you have an index that specifies the sort order of tuples in the, in the, in the database pages, the table pages. So when we talked about the heap before, I said it was unordered. With a clustering index, the, the database system will enforce the sort order of the tuples across all the pages. Think of it sort of like one giant file that's broken up in different pages. It'll keep those tuples in those, in those pages in the order specified by the index. So that, so in the, with a, if you have a clustering index, you don't have this problem because, which I, I can jump back to, you don't have this problem because the, as you scan the pages, I, I, sorry, as you scan the leaf nodes, the, the pages, the tuples that you scan across will always be either in the current page or the next page. And when you go to the next page, you never go back to a previous one. So I'll do one, my one fetch, get the thing I need, find all the tuples I need to find in it, then I throw it away and go on to the next one. Whereas if you don't have a clustered index, then it's just, it's random which ones you do you, your lookup on, right? Which is really inefficient. So you want to then just find all your record IDs ahead of time, then, then scan them and, and then shove them out. So, yes? Right, so his question is, uh, for this particular example, the, the query has a where clause that contains the lookup on the, that the index is, is, is indexed, or the attribute that the index is, is, is based on. Correct, yes. Because okay. otherwise I wasn't sure like, how we would know where to stop this game. Yeah, correct. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll sort of get to this next. But basically think of like, um, if your where clause is, you know, where age is less than 30, or say, where age is greater than 30. You just find the first tuple, the first record with age equals 30, or maybe age equals, you know, the one, one less than that. And then now when you scan across, you're guaranteed that everything will be, every person you find will be greater than 30. Now say you have something like where age is greater than 30 and less than 50, the data system will know that, oh, I had this less than 50 thing, and that's my, my stopping point, right? And this is sort of what I was saying before, too, about pushing down hints for some of these different processing models, because if you have age greater than 30, limit 20, you don't want to scan across all the leaves. You want to stop after you, after you find 20 things, right? So, um, okay. So now we want to talk about how do we actually evaluate these, these expressions, these predicates. So in the same way that a query plan is represented as a tree data structure, uh, our expressions will be also, or predicates will be also be represented in, in what's called an expression tree. Right? So say that we have our, a really simple query like this. Right? The, the where clause will be represented with some da a data structure that more or less looks like this. And so you have different nodes in your expression tree that represent the different things that you're trying to do in your predicates. So you have comparisons, equal to greater than, less than, all those things. All your conjunctions, ands, and ors, uh, arithmetic operators, constant values, and then, and then tuple attribute references. So any expression that you can have in your where clause, and I'm focused on where clause because it's the easiest one to understand, but the same idea would, would apply to doing halvings, doing projections, and, and, and other things. Right? It always, can always be represented as a, as a tree like this. So I'm... I'm Going to avoid subqueries for now. Uh, they complicate this slightly, but in general, this is how every single database system can initially represent the, uh, your, your expression. So now the question is, how do we actually evaluate this? So when you run a query, say a simple one like this, right, the where clause is where b.val is equal to some dollar sign, which is a placeholder pr parameter for an input value that the, the application gives you, plus one. So we can, we'll, we'll represent it as a tree like this. 
So just like before, in the iterator model, we start from the top down. When you traverse this expression in order to evaluate it, you start from the top down. And at every single node, as you go along, you figure out, well, what, what's this node trying to do? And I look at my left and right children and figure out, you know, traverse down the BEM, evaluate them, and then push things up uh, as needed to, to your parent. So to do an evaluation, typically what happens is you, you have some context information about the query that's running that you want to apply this predicate. So you'll store things like, what's the current tuple that I'm examining? Right? If you're doing a sequential scan or, or index scan, it's still the same. Uh, what are the input parameters for, the, for this query invocation that I want to use to fill in my, my question marks? And then what's the table schema? How can I interpret uh, any, any tuple that's referenced? How do I interpret the attributes that, that, that are stored inside of it? So in this case here, I start with the equal sign. I go to my left child, and I see that it's a reference to an attribute in the tuple. Uh, and it's referencing the attribute value. So I would look up in my table schema and say, well, value, the val attribute is the, is the second attribute for this tuple. So I know how to go look now in the current tuple that I'm processing, jump to the second location for the second, second attribute, and then I get my value 1,000. Then I go back up to the equal sign, then go down to the right side, and then do the same thing. I look at my, my plus sign, it goes down to the left, it has a reference to an input parameter. I now uh, look onto my array that's passed in my context, I spit out 99, go to my constant, uh, go, go to the right side, it's looking for the constant value 1, that's just 1, and then now I, I push everything up, do, do the addition, and, and per, do the evaluation, and I end up with true. Right, so this is Pretty straightforward to understand. Again, this is how every single database system will represent their expressions. It's not how all of them actually evaluate them. So what's an obvious problem with this? Correct. So this statement is if you have a really deep tree, you're losing out on a lot of efficiency problems. Uh, now, some systems will, will be clever about certain things and, and which we'll talk about when we do query optimization. Like, if you have uh, transitive closures or other things where you know, like, A equals 1 and B equals 1 and A equals B, you can just put that down to, you know, you, you can strip out one, one of those, those expressions. But let's say, you know, sort of related, not even worry about, you know, a really deep tree. Let's just say you have a billion tuples. For every single tuple you're going to evaluate, you have to traverse this tree and do all the things I just walked through and apply them one by one. And it's actually even more, uh, more onerous than I'm actually letting on because what will happen is at every single time you want to look at maybe like the attribute of a tuple, you have to look in the schema and say, well, it's, a it's an integer and it's 32 bits and here's the offset of where it is in the tuple. And maybe the thing I'm adding it with is a 8-bit integer, so maybe I need to cast that up to be 32 bits. So there's all this like type checking it's doing for these different values based on the schema to make sure that you can actually apply the operations you want to apply. Because right? that way, if someone passes in a constant value for you know, the string 1, 2, 3, or string 1, it knows how to then convert that to the integer. Right? So this is really, really slow. Um, but as I said, this is what most database systems actually do. Uh, and so it's not just all the type checking, but it's just you know, the, the process of Traversing that tree is really bad. So let's say in this really simple example, I have a query that has a where clause where 1 equals 1. Now, as we'll talk about later on, the data system can be smart and recognize that this is always equal to true, so it can, it can optimize this away. But if you couldn't do that, then again, you're starting with the equal sign, going down the left, going down the right, and then implying the, the, the comparison. So what, the data, what you really want to do in your database system uh, sort of think of this as like just-in-time compilation. What you really want to do is just evaluate the expression directly uh, using, and it, this allows you to use a, a, a significantly fewer number of instructions, and you don't have to chase pointers. So instead of having this tree that I interpret, I can just take 1 equals 1, write the machine instructions that actually to do that comparison, and just execute that. There's some extra work you have to do to make sure you're, you're, you're type safe and all that good stuff. But this is significantly faster, especially when you have, you know, doing these large scans on, you know, over a billion tuples in your table. And this problem applies not only when you're doing index scans, but also sequential scans. 
Right? Just because you have an index that allows you to jump to, to some location along your pages much more quickly, as you go down through the index, you're basically traversing this tree right? for every single key you do your, you do your evaluation on. So a lot of the commercial systems, uh, and actually I think the newer version of Postgres, Postgres 10, can do this kind of uh, expression evaluation by doing more or less compilation. Think of this as the difference between like Python interpretation or uh, versus like compiling something to like C++. Yes? What are the So his statement is, um, uh, instead of doing just-in-time compilation as you're doing it on the fly, as you evaluate it, you can actually compile things before you even start running the query. You're correct. This is, you know, yeah, so this is what actually systems actually do. And this is actually what we do in our, in our system. And the speed up you get from not having to traverse this tree is actually quite significant for, for OLAP queries. All right, I'm saying compilation, sort of think of it in the same way. Like, like you, you can generate the byte code, but then you still have to interpret it. But if you compile the machine code, it's way, way faster. And again, not to keep bringing up the advanced course in the spring, but in some systems, not only do they compile the expressions into machine code, you actually can compile the entire query plan to machine code. So in the processing models I showed you, we talked about traversing those, those operators, and you're essentially, you're essentially doing interpretation. The operator is a scan. What does it want to scan? How do I scan it? Right? And figures those things out as it runs. All those things, because, because you have SQL is declarative and you know what the schema is ahead of time, you can generate actually the machine instructions to just execute the query plan just without doing any interpretation. And the speed up is quite significant. The tricky thing though is compilation is not free, right? That, that takes a little time. So there's, but there's some tricks to get around that. Okay, the main thing I want to say is again, the, we internally will represent the expressions in our where clauses, having clauses, and projections, and everything else, as these expression trees with these different operators. And the most, you know, sort of primitive database systems, if I don't use that term, will actually just traverse this tree in order to do the evaluation. Right, this is what people typically implement the first time, right, the first time you start building a system. But what you really want to end up doing is do some kind of compilation where you just can now look at the expression uh, directly and apply it to, to your tuples. OK? All right, so just to finish up, the, in this class, we talked about the different ways the data system can execute the, the, a query plan. And what actually is kind of cool, it's, it's, everything we talked about here is pretty much independent of all the different things we talked about in the course so far. right? Whether you're using a row store or a column store, all the different models that we talked about here st still apply. Whether you're using a B plus tree, a radix tree, a hash table, all those, the process models still apply as well. Um, in general, most database systems are want to always try to do an index scan as much as possible, because uh, they're always going to be much faster. This is definitely the case for OLTP workloads. If your OLTP application is doing sequential scan, it's never going to work. It's never going to scale. So you always want to add indexes. And the reason why I say most database systems is because, again, there's the uh, specialized column store systems that maybe don't want any indexes at all. So Vertica, for example, Vertica you cannot, you can't call create index, right? Because they pre-sort all their columns, and therefore that's the same thing as as having you know binary search in a in a in, a, in an index. So most systems want to want to try to do indexing as much as possible. And we show how to do this in both the for a single index or multiple indexes. And then for the expression trees, the, what I showed you is the is sort of the most common or flexible way to actually implement them, but they're slow because of all that uh, uh, pointer chasing. Okay? Any questions? Okay. So project number two. As I said, it's going to go out today. The website is not live, but it will be later on after, after the class. So you will be building a single-threaded B plus tree index. Uh, the reason why I'm saying single thread is because we didn't, haven't talked about how to do latching and other things. Um, so for now, we're just, we're, you just keep it single threaded. And so you'll have to design the layout set. 
So the same rules as we talked about before, things to be, that you should be mindful of is that you, sh you don't, should not have to change any file other than the six ones that we specify. Um, now, there is going to be an updated source tarball that we're going to provide for you guys. Uh, and because there's a bunch of new stuff that we've added in order to run this, this second project. So you'll need to copy over the six files that you submitted from the first project and plop them into the same location for the second project. Right? All these projects are cumulative. So you're the buffer pool manager that you use, that you implemented for the first project, is what your index would use to go fetch uh, the tree node or node pages. And as always, please post any questions you have to Canvas or come to the TA's office hours. All right? So and again, it goes without saying, please don't post any of your code on GitHub. Please don't uh, borrow code from each other or steal code from each other. Right? Everything you turn into us should always be your, your work because we're going to run the, the code checker, the plagi plagiarism checker on, uh, on Autolab. OK? Any questions? Yeah, we, 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 we can make a patch, yes. OK, yeah. OK. All right, uh, for next class, uh, I'm actually going to be away. And uh, Joy Ruraj, my PhD student here at CMU, he will be teaching you guys. Uh, Joy has a disorder known as um, sort of minor Tourette syndrome. So he has, a, he has this problem where he curses a lot when he speaks. So we've asked him to try to limit that. And we'll have somebody in the back that sort of can monitor this, the way he doesn't go into tirades of profanity. So if there's more cursing in the next class than in this class, I apologize. Joy's, Joy's been working on that. But he's going to now, again, talk about more query execution. So now we know how to read the data from the tables and the indexes. Now we're going to shove them up to the other operators in a query plan and start doing things with them. So he's going to focus on doing uh, sorting and then actually start talking about how to do, how to do joins. Okay. So please give Joy the same respect that you would give me. <laughs> All right? I'll see you guys on, uh, on Monday, but come to class on Wednesday. Thank you. <laughs>